Good morning. Thank you for coming back. And welcome to day two of the No Identity Conference. I'm excited about all of the uh, wonderful programming that we have this morning, um, well, and this afternoon. Um, and for those of you who haven't had a chance, uh, we also have a startup alley outside in the amphitheater foyer um, with some really exciting companies out there. So if you haven't made your way over, definitely suggest you check it out. We've got folks like uh, Cambridge Blockchain over there who uh, earlier this week announced uh, a really interesting digital identity program partnered with Lux Trust in Luxembourg um, and a bunch of other uh, companies. So do make your way over there if you haven't had a chance to check them out. Um, some of you have asked us, um, what's next for One World Identity after this event? Are we all, you know, going on vacation? Um, and unless you consider the BWI airport to be an exotic destination, the answer is we're right back to work. Um, we're very excited to be growing our research and market analysis presence. Um, in fact, we've actually just released our first report um, on the identity landscape in Asia. And Kaylin, who's the lead researcher on that, um, is actually here from Tokyo. So highly suggest that you take advantage of her presence if you had any questions. Uh, the report is available both in our booth and also online. Um, it's the first in a series of reports that we're planning on doing. Um, not only are we expanding the regional focus outside of Asia, but we'll actually be doing um, some deeper dives in some of the topics in the report, like the regulatory landscape, uh, technology advancements, and also markets and sectors to watch. Um, uh, so stay tuned for more of that. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, Dave Birch usually needs little by way of introduction. Most of you probably know him from his days at Consult Hyperion. He is the author of Identity is the New Money and has another book, Before Babylon, Beyond Bitcoin, coming out this summer. Um, and Dave did ask me if he could use uh, some rather risque content in his presentation. And of course, I said yes. So I suppose that this serves as your mandatory PG-13 warning for this session. And with that, uh, welcome, Dave. I don't really understand the new landscape of safe spaces and trigger words, so but so thank you for... But if anyone does have the trigger word, uh, underpants, now might be a good time to drift towards the back slightly. So, uh, so what I'm going to talk about uh, today is uh, two of my favorite topics in identity at the moment. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Internet of Things, and we're going to talk a little bit about blockchain. Adam Cooper yesterday said, uh, and I agree with him, by the way, he said blockchain is a movement, not a technology. And uh, I don't want to be accused of just slavishly getting on board any passing bandwagon. Um, so let me point out that I was going to talk about blockchain before yesterday when I arrived, and it turned out everybody was talking about blockchain. So just you know, I want you to see that I'm a thought leader, not just, <laughs> not just jumping on this bandwagon. So, uh, but I just want, I want to put it, just a benchmark in before I start talking. So uh, I was listening to the presentations yesterday. So um, identity for people basically fixed was the message I picked up from yesterday. That's kind of, that's all taken care of. We don't really need to worry about that too much. There are one or two minor wrinkles that need ironing out probably. Like, for example, yesterday when I asked for ID, I showed the expired building pass from our office in New York, which apparently is a gold standard of identity in the United States. So that was fine. No problem. I brought, actually, when we were in New York last week, there was a couple of buildings that I had to show ID to get into the buildings. And so, so, I, I, show, and they, they, so I go through this usual pantomime. Howard's sick of it. But, you know, we go... Okay, if you show ID, and then I go, no, I don't have any ID. I don't live in North Korea. You don't need ID to walk down the street. Of course I haven't got any ID. It's, and they said, well, you can't come in unless you've got some ID, right? This happened last week. So I showed them my, this is my season ticket photo card for the railway in the UK. Uh, I mean, it's, you're talking about it like it's, it's laminated, right? So, <laughs> but uh, we were talking about levels of assurance. So in order to get one of these, it's not like you can just walk up and get one of these. I mean, you, you walk up and get one, but you have to take a photo with you. And then you write your name on the card and you stick the photo on it and they laminate it, right? And I used this last week to get into buildings in New York to do it. So I'm just, I just, so it's basically fixed. Okay, there are one or two little sort of wrinkles to, 
But I, I I'm not going to worry about those because yesterday, because blockchain, right? So we don't need to worry about that too much anymore. And now that we have the cognitive blockchain, which was uh, the, that's the blockchain with Watson on top that does the, you guys were listening to this yesterday, right? So Watson is, it's that IBM, it's the smart thing. Did anybody go to the, the Watson thing in Las Vegas? Uh, a few, you got, you see, you got in, I didn't get in. So our good friends at IBM, they invited us to come to the Watson thing in Las Vegas. I mean, it's got nothing to do with the presentation, I just want to make a point. And so, and so they send us the invites, like Steve gets one, I get one. They send us the invites, and on the invite, it's pages, so you've got to fill out, you know, job titles and descriptions. So I put all the usual stuff in, job title, dictator for life, and all this kind of thing, just fill out any old thing I fill in. And at the end, there was like a free text box, and it said, if you tell Watson the purpose of your visit, Watson will help to point you in the right direction to see different. So in the text box, it's the purpose of visit, I put to overthrow the government of the United States and replace it with a workers and peasants collective. And I, I didn't get in, Steve got in. And now I'm on the no-fly list, so the joke sort of backfired, really, a little bit on that one, so. But anyway, so because blockchain, basically, that's taken care of, we don't need to worry. So remember there was that stupid cartoon, every lazy management consultant in the world for 20 years Used, I did too, used that same cartoon from the New Yorker. Remember on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. And then a couple of years ago, somebody came up with a sort of funny version, which was on the internet, no one knows you're a fridge. Because remember that, that big thing about those fridges getting hacked and, and taking down stuff or whatever. Um, and now I've sort of synthesized this into on the internet, nobody knows you're a fridge pretending to be a dog. Because I feel that's the progress we've made in two decades of identity. We've gone from being able to not tell whether it's a dog on the internet, and today, well, now we can't tell if it's a fridge pretending to be a dog. So that's, that's the progress that we've made in the identity space. And if you think I'm just being, so, or you could just look at the figures. I mean, the, the new identity fraud figures for the UK came out a couple of weeks ago. It's at absolutely record levels. The curve is just straight up. And by the way, it's about to get worse because of the frictionless infrastructure that we're all pushing to bring into payments, right? Because if you're a 20-year-old MIT computer science, self-sovereign, whatever, then frictionless sounds fantastic. But we can see from the fraud figures around instant credit transfers in the UK, it's, this isn't an untrammeled good, right? Because the, one of the biggest frauds Actually, it's also one of my favorite frauds. You're not supposed to have a favorite fraud, I don't think, on this sort of thing. But one of my biggest frauds, uh, and, and it, it, this relies on lawyers, right? Because lawyers insist on using email, which, frankly, if a lawyer sends you an email about that's a prima facie case for professional discipline. They should be struck off, deleted. Like, if they send you confidential information in an email, this is what lawyers do. They send it in email. Instead of using something secure, I mean, it's easy to know what's secure, because in the in the... In the UK at the moment, the Home Secretary is, is, is getting really upset about Signal, Telegram, was it? So the things that the Home Secretary is upset about, broadly speaking, those are the things that are secure, and that's what lawyers should be using. And like, so what happens is lawyers send these emails, oh, uh, you know, your house purchase is going through, please send the $100,000 to, to this account, right? And so the criminals, because they're, the, they're in the lawyer's email servers, they just resend the email and it says, oh, please, by the way, the account number we gave you in that last, that was the old one, you know, it's not really Citibank in Washington. It's actually the Dunkin' Donuts on Minsk Railway Station. And people just type in and send the money. And then they phone up the bank and say, where's my money gone? And the bank says, well, hold on, you gave us strong two-factor authentication to send your money to the Dunkin' Donuts on Minsk Railway Station. So it's not our fault, and they're right, it isn't. And hundreds of thousands are going. So not only has identity fraud not been fixed, it's worse than ever, and it's about to get even worse. I mean, I know I'm worrying too much because blockchain, but I'm just flagging up with you. I, I mean, I'm not being mean to the audience here because there are some people in here who are seasoned identity profession. Don, for example, has been in this for a while, since that dog thing, you know. Um, and it's got worse. So not only is everything 
as bad as it was before. It's as bad, and now it's more inconvenient. I lost my phone in, in a, a couple of weeks ago. I, I was in Denmark, and I, I accidentally left my phone in a taxi in Denmark, right? And it's like, whatever, it's just my, because I've got a spare phone. Like, all normal people have a spare phone, right? So as you get the spare phone out, and I think everything's going to be okay. And the taxi company said, oh, yeah, we found the, we found the phone, so we're, we'll FedEx it to you. And it's great, that's fine. I've got my spare phone. You know how useful a spare phone was? Not at all. Nobody ever phones me. And even, I mean, you don't really use phones for, pho you know, you know what I mean? Like parents maybe. But I mean, we, you don't use your phone for phoning, right? So the fact that nobody could phone me, I don't care. I want people to phone me anyway. When they do phone me, I don't answer. So it doesn't make any difference, right? Because if there's anything important, people text you or send Twitter messages or something. So losing the phone is no problem. Until I'm in New York... And I get a thing from my son saying, oh, you know, you forgot to send me the money for college uh, this month. And I'm like, oh, shit, I did right. So I go and log in. And now I can't log in because the app is on the other phone. OK, so I go to, re I download the app to the new phone, go to log in, and it sends the security code which allow me to log in by SMS to the old phone. Because they haven't read any of the NIST documentation which says SMS is no longer considered secure. And in fact, any bank that uses SMS for security, it's just not taking it seriously. And because of the SS7 hacks a couple of weeks ago, the large scale infiltration of text messaging is already underway. So if your bank is even using SMS for 2FA, as far as I can see, they're negligent already. But that's beside the point. The point is, I lost my phone and it didn't matter for making phone calls, but now I couldn't do anything because anything I wanted to log into, I had to have the application on the old phone and the only way I could move it was by them sending the text message. And on a couple of my accounts, when I was here last time, I got a little T-Mobile SIM that I put in my phone that I was using while I was here. And I registered a couple of things, it was a bank account and whatever, with this phone. And then it turns out the T-Mobile, it only lasts for like a month. And then when you go and top it up again, you get a new number. So you get these weird phone calls from people. Hey, Tony. I'm like, what? And then when I try and log into the bank, they're sending the text message to Tony. And I can't log in. So anyway, look. I don't want to be, I'm saying it's basically fixed, okay? <laughs> because blockchain. Uh, so as that's basically, if I, so there'll be more fun to talk about things today. So I invented a hashtag. I, I don't know much about security, I do know about marketing. So like if you want to start, you have to start with the hashtag. So I got the hashtag ID for the internet of things, hashtag idiot, which I think is very appropriate. <laughs> So if you want to tweet abuse at any level uh, during the presentation, please make sure you use the right hashtag, ID for the Internet of Things, hashtag idiot. Uh, and I promise, I, I don't care what degree of abuse, uh, as long as it's got the right hashtag. I understand marketing, seeing that's the point. So let's talk about ID for the Internet of Things. So I thought I'd show you a couple of real examples to show you that this is a serious thing. So this is from CES in Las Vegas. Who went to CES in Las Vegas in January? They say, I know you didn't, I just, but I did. I went to Las Vegas in January. Did I mention I was in Denmark as well a couple of weeks ago? So, so, uh, so we went to CES in Las Vegas and, uh, because they had their first uh, digital money thing this year. And so I took a couple of pictures at things to make a point. So these are Wi-Fi kettles. So uh, you buy this kettle and you connect it to your Wi-Fi. That's it. Were you expecting a punchline? On, I mean, that's, I've literally no idea why you would do this. I, I was, I'm baffled by the whole thing. But the point is, you can buy a kettle and connect it to your Wi-Fi. And don't you feel like, I'm so happy they're not wasting their time on like Alzheimer's and, and things like this. You know? so, so you could buy a kettle and you can connect it to your Wi-Fi. And, and I would never do this because at our forum in London last year, we had a presentation from a guy called Ken Munro, who's the Samsung smart TV hacker. And he showed how to get into these kettles. And basically, if you get into the kettle, it means you get access to the home Wi-Fi network. So if you buy one of these kettles, you're effectively opening up your home Wi-Fi network to anybody that wants to use it. But on the other hand, you can turn the kettle on from Tokyo. You know, there's a use case out there somewhere. I'm too old. This is the thing. I can't think of the use cases. I'm too old. 
but I'm not traducing the enterprise that went into this because I, I know someone else is using this for something just really great. I just can't think what it is. Okay, so, but so anyway, so the point is we're connecting up uh, kettles is the point. I know you're not writing this down. I know this, this is an important point. We're connecting up kettles for no obvious reason. So, and it wasn't just things like kettle says. No, so this is Fitbit for dogs. This is one of my favourite things. Actually, this is my second favourite thing. You'll see my favourite thing in a minute. So, Fitbit for dogs. I'm laughing my ass off watching this. Now, Nick, my commercial manager, would go. He goes, I don't know why you're laughing. That storm, that stall was rammed. Like I'm laughing. I was Fitbit for dogs. That's the funniest thing. He goes, like, why are you laughing? They're storming this stand. These things are going to walk out the stores themselves. Like, I'm laughing. These people are going to be millionaires. Fitbits for dogs. They won't be able to make them fast enough. I can tell you right now. That's, they were rammed at that stall. Fitbit for dogs. And it wasn't just like, they had, actually, there was a lot of pet stuff there, actually, wasn't there? It wasn't just the Fitbits and things. They had a thing where you could play with your, like, from the office, you could log in and play with your dog at home. So there was, like, a thing you put on the wall at home that had, like, a ball that would move around right? And you could press a button and it would dispense dog treats from the, from the, um, actually I've just had an idea about that because you could use that for children as well, couldn't you? That's, <laughs> no, I apologize, but I'm English. We prefer dogs generally to children. But the point is you could use it. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Where, where's the emergency on-call patent lawyer? We had, there must be one in the building somewhere. So Fitbit for dogs. So the thing here is, it's not just people buying things that are stupid for themselves. It's people buying things that are stupid for their dogs as well. And I thought, actually, I thought of a good, I already thought of a good TV series idea of this because I love, I love Homeland. It's one of my favorite shows. And so I thought this would be a great, right, because what you do is you get the, these, these are Bluetooth, so you get the ID of the collar. And then when you want to murder somebody, Instead of having to follow them round and whatever, you just set the bomb up in a garbage can or something, and then when, when the dog goes past, it reads the collar and bang, you know, and then you can be miles away. I mean, it's a great... I sent it in to them, so we'll, you know, fingers crossed, because I just I want to be on TV, you know? And I want to make them sorry, because they turned down pro-celebrity bomb disposal, which was my favourite TV show idea of all time. They turned it down. I was like, if there was pro-celebrity bomb disposal on television, you'd, you'd never watch anything else. It was the best television show idea ever. Pro-celebrity bomb disposal. They didn't want to know. But anyway, I think this might, this might be the breakthrough for me. So Fitbit for dogs. This is my favorite one. This is the most disgusting stand at CES Vegas. So this is for Bluetooth socks. So you get your socks and you, you hook them up by Bluetooth. And if you don't, they had this disgusting rubber model of like all the horrible, it's very realistic by the way. There's disgusting rubber model of all the terrible things that could happen to your feet if you don't have Bluetooth socks. <laughs> and that's, that's marketing right there, isn't it? That's, I'm st you know, it's months later and I'm still showing it to you. I'm still showing you the Bluetooth socks because I can't stop thinking about it. I have nightmares about this, about this thing. Like you wake up in the middle of the night and you even as the Bluetooth link's gone down, your socks are unconnected and your feet are disintegrating <laughs> even while you're, while you're, so Bluetooth socks. So kettles, Fitbits for dogs, Bluetooth socks. Basically, we're connecting everything to everything because it turns out connecting things up is really pretty easy, right? There's, there's, you know, putting a little Bluetooth chip inside, connecting out, that's no problem at all. So the temptation to connect things up is absolutely overwhelming. So I thought, well, okay, well, let's, let's pick. So I'm talking generically about, like, like, we're connecting everything up, the Internet of Things, but you guys, you won't really think about that unless we get more specific and have a more specific example. So I thought, let's go fashion. I think you're a fashion crowd. So this is me at London Fashion Week. And uh, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. That is, that is the 2011 Marks and Spencer's collection. You're absolutely spot on. So, uh, so this is me at London Fashion Week. And we were doing some work at Fashion Week to do with uh, NFC tags in clothing. I won't, I won't tell you the whole story of the, 
the whole thing, um, except to say uh, this involved trying to explain how to use an NFC tag reader to people who were crying. I mean, they're actually crying in the right because the taxi with the shoes in went to the wrong house or something, and you know, one of the dresses, the buttons were the wrong color, or whatever. These people were hysterical and crying. And I'm trying to explain to them about how you use NFC tag readers. To, to close. So it's a good lesson. But the point is, I went to London Fashion Week. And so that made me think, uh, OK, well, let's use, let's use clothing as the example. That's like a simple example. Everybody has clothes. So we'll use clothing as the kind of thought case to work out what we're going to do about this. The internet of clothes. OK, so here's a simple example. So here is, uh, these are readable tags that are washable. Um, they're uh, woven into the tags that go inside the clothes. And, you know, it's an obvious example of something where, like if you, the, the example they're showing there is to do with washing machines. I mean, these washing machines at this instant don't exist. But the point is, if there was a washing machine, like suppose you just take the clothes and you put them all in the washing machine and the clothes tell the washing machine what they are, and then the washing machine says, oh, you can't wash these things with those things. You need to separate them out. That's the kind of thing that we're thinking of here. Right, so uh, there may be a gender component to this question, but I'll ask it anyway. So who would pay $100 more for a washing machine that could do that? See, now the women are just, now that's unfair, because now you're making me seem sexist, and that's not really, so the thing is, he would too, but he just won't put his hand up. Right? I'm more comfortable with this sort of thing. So the thing is, if you had a washing machine that could tell you not to put these, because it's very complicated looking at all the little labels and working out which things, and they have these hieroglyphs on, which I'm not absolutely certain what they all mean. So the thing is, if you could pay like an extra hundred dollars, I don't. I mean, like I try, I, I don't know which ones go in which, and I've been told a thousand times on this. <laughs> So, so the point is, you would pay another hundred dollars to have a washing machine that could do this sort of thing, right? So, so here you have a simple use case, and you have clear value-added propositions, whereby people would actually pay real money to use these things properly. Good. So, uh, so we'll we'll focus on clothes. So here's the real sort of use case for it. And uh, and I thought, but I'm a British. I'm here to fly the flag. I'm here to remind you uh, about the flag. Um, I did say to Howard earlier, because he's from Boston, so I did mention to him that you know, that whole no more kings thing, I know it's not working out so great. Uh, or, so to, the Tea Party thing, it's literally water under the bridge. It's literally water under the bridge. So, you know, it's like any time, you're welcome back. So, the, uh, so I just, I'm showing you the flag just to remind you the, the possibilities. So, uh, so the citizen thing, overrated, subjects, more comfortable, to be honest. So, uh, so this is Vivian Westwood. Vivian Westwood is a, is a famous English clothes designer, is uh, Vivian Westwood. And, uh, and that's, in fact, me standing in front of the Vivian Westwood flag, because I, I'm here to literally fly the flag on this kind of thing. That, that's not just, that is an actual designer Vivian Westwood flag that I'm standing in front of there. And here's the Vivian Westwood shop. And they've started putting tags inside some of the clothes. By the way, some of these clothes are like stupid expensive. I mean, you wouldn't know. Like, you look in there's like a t-shirt and something, and you think, you know, I don't know. I'll probably get one of those a swag at no ID. And they want like $13,000 for it. So these things are protected with these tags because you don't want them to be stolen and that sort of thing. But also, if you've just paid $13,000 for one of these t-shirts, and you're walking down the street, like, wouldn't you want people to know, like, this is a 13, like, if you're the sort of person that would buy a $13,000 t-shirt, then you're kind of an asshole. So you want everybody else to know that you've got a $13,000. What's the point of a $13,000 t-shirt if nobody in the street knows you're wearing a $13,000 t-shirt, right? So you want the tag to be very clear. I mean, you don't have to say, it'd be crass. You don't have to say $13,000. I mean, that would be, you know, maybe in New York it would say the actual. But I mean, we'd feel uncomfortable saying it. But it would say this is a Vivian Westwood shirt and aren't I cool? I mean, that's kind of what it would say. 
And, uh, and actually, in fact, you can imagine this for all sorts of like luxury goods, right? So if you've got, if you've got like one of those fancy watches like rappers have that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Then you would want people to know, I mean, like, suppose the tag could say, look, I don't want people to think I've got some bullshit watch, right? Like that one, the one, Travis's one, right? So, so you know, I, so I've, got a, I've got a watch that costs $200,000 because I'm a rapper. Uh, but for people like me, I don't care. I couldn't tell it from a hole in the ground. So it needs to broadcast to me, this is a $200,000 watch. I still won't care, but y you get the point. What's the point of having luxury goods if they can't tell other people that they're luxury goods, right? That's why you want to put chips in things. So, but of course, there's a problem with this because now if I'm a master criminal, okay? So let's say I'm a master criminal and I've got a nice sideline in knocking out fake Vivian West with $13,000 t-shirts and selling them in Hong Kong for $20. That was a good business, right? But now it's not a good business because they don't have the chips. So now, instead of stealing the t-shirts, I need to steal the chips. So I'll steal some chips that say that they're Vivian Westwood. And actually, for me as the criminal, that's quite a good deal. Because to make my fake Vivian Westwood t-shirt, I had to at least put a bit of effort in. I mean, you've got to make it like a nice t Like, it's got to look like it was like a proper t-shirt and sewn properly and whatever. Now I don't. As long as I've got the chip, any old bullshit t-shirt will do as long as I can put the chip in it that says it's a real one. So, uh, but anyway, chips in clothes, it's a fantastic idea. I don't, want to, I don't want to put you off it. There's lots of value added purpose. And also the other thing is, like, who would be allowed, like suppose I walk into Vivian's store now with my little reader, I can read all the stock in there now. So now I know how a shop is doing. Now I know what's selling and what isn't. So I come back the next day and I see which things are selling and I go straight to the shop around the corner with his rival designer and I tell him, you know, people are paying $13,000 for these t-shirts, get your skates on. So maybe we might want to constrain just a little bit the data that people are allowed to read from these things. But maybe not because uh, blockchain, right? So... Um, <clears throat> So here's the audience here. So that pen thing, that will read those tags. For the, for the uh, UHF RFID tags, that will read something like 100 tags a second at a range of 300 feet or something. I can't remember exactly. But the point is, remember the old sort of public speaking trick where you were supposed to imagine the audience naked? But you see, if you have one of those pens, now you don't really have to imagine. Because in the time I've been up here talking, the pen would have read everybody's clothes. And I would know what every single person in the audience was wearing. And so it's a simple matter for Photoshop Double Plus to go to Facebook and get your picture from Facebook and take off the clothes and give me like an artist's. So you don't have to, you don't have to imagine these things anymore because the tags will do it for you. Now, uh, and some people might think that's a bad thing. I don't know. I'm not an entrepreneur who's building opportunities on top of this. But I can see there are a few straightforward use cases which, which would, so for example, if I go around to Susan's house for dinner and I'm kind of wondering, oh, I wonder if Susan's got any interesting new underwear. Normally, I have to wait until she goes out to get some milk or something. And then I've got to go and look through the drawers and have a quick look in the cupboards and whatever. It's quite time consuming, it's quite inconvenient. But with my pen, I can just walk in, woohoo, you know, nice. And my iPad will pull it straight up and, and she thinks I'm looking at the New York Times on this <laughs> thing, right? So wait a second, that doesn't sound quite right. I mean, I think it would enhance the gaiety of the nation significantly. But, you know, there are people here who keep going on and on about privacy, Canadians mainly. <laughs> and they have a different view of this sort of thing, okay? So, <clears throat> so I don't want to say this would have to happen, but I'm just what I'm saying is this is how the Internet of Things works. People go around putting chips in things, and they don't really think the whole thing through, and then you end up with a Chernobyl when this data goes out. There's also some more sinister aspects to it as well. Because, for example, suppose, my, suppose I read all the clothes that Howard is wearing right now. 
I mean, I know it's just a cheap average suit and shirt and whatever, but the point is they're all unique. So if I read the tags on all his clothes right now, the chances of any other human being on the entire planet wearing exactly the same combination of clothes is statistically zero. So not only has my pen figured out what you're all wearing for various despicable and salacious purposes, it's also ID'd you, every single one of you. Because every single one of you here is wearing a clothes selection which is utterly unique. So now I know who everybody is. And I can go to my database and say, where was that clothes selection last seen? And my database will say, well, we saw this collection of clothes uh, a couple of weeks ago at this kind of Chinese herbal remedy medicine place up on, you know. And I said, that's quite interesting. I didn't know you had a bad back. Doesn't sound so good now, does it? It sounded like a great idea when Vivian West was putting the chips in the clothes. But when you actually think about what it means to have an internet of things, not so funny. But actually, you know, but come on, entrepreneurs, right? So people think of things to do with it. So I started thinking, okay, I should be more positive about this whole thing. So let's suppose we were going to be creative about thinking what kind of business things. So this is the idea, because I, I, I was getting a bit worried about, like, I don't mind if my underpants kind of broadcast a few things about me, you know. And, uh, you know, Susan's underwear and my underwear, you know, they can communicate and chat. And I mean, I wouldn't want them to cut us out of the loop. Uh, but, you know, we wouldn't mind if they had a little chat, right? And then I was thinking, well, OK, so we could hook this up with something like Tinder or, uh, you know, some other dating thing. And then, and, but you think of how much time and effort that would save, right? So we go on a date together, and your iPad can straight away tell you how long it was since these pants went, pants went near a washing machine. It's the sort of thing women are interested in. I don't care, you know. But on a date thing, that would be really... And then I could look on my iPad, oh, I wonder if she's wearing new underwear. Because that's what economists would call a weak signal for change in these circumstances. <laughs> so, you know, I wouldn't want to be cut out of the loop. But if they wanted to chat, that's OK, right? And then I thought, you know, you could use the API. You could add that onto something like Tinder for your choices, because I think a lot of women would choose. I want someone who's you know, six foot tall, an airline pilot, and earns $10 million a year, and has clean pants. That's the sort of thing they would put on one of the options down there. So that would be a very positive thing for people, you see. So OK, so privacy, but you know, lots of entrepreneurial activity that we'd all want to see. But it presents a number of security challenges. Obviously, it does. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. It does present a few security challenges. So because I might start getting picky about who's allowed to talk to my underwear, uh, I might want to change it on a daily basis. Sometimes I'm walking down the street, I'm happy for my underwear to get engaged in conversations with other people as it goes past. Other days, maybe not. I might want to tune it. So you know, you'd want it like on a little dial or something. You could turn up and down. But nevertheless, it would work. But it does present a few security challenges. So if we're trying to think, how are we going to take the stuff that we know, right? Because there's people in this audience who know everything about PKI key certificate hierarchy encryption stuff, right? So I challenge them, you know, you and my underpants, right? Let's get down to it. How are you going to help my underpants? Low power devices, no cryptography, no tamper resistant memory for keys. I do have another solution to the key problem, but I, I won't mention it in front of this audience. Uh, <clears throat> underpants have intermittent connection. They may not always be connected. You may, you know, they'll be at home sometime. They may often be in the attacker's domain. And what I mean by that is, for example, if I was a dedicated international terrorist hell-bent on overthrowing the established order here, um, I would target the hotel laundry then, you see, because then what I would do is I would read the tags on all of the clothes in the laundry, and then I would know who was staying in the hotel, you know, and I would know which room to send the bomb to and all this sort of thing. Um, and also, when the underpants are in the attacker's domain, of course, the attacker has got plenty of time to attack them uh, mechanically or electronically or whatever. So that means if you're going to try to start making them tamper-resistant, the tamper-resistance will actually be quite expensive. Because you, know, you could have ample time to attack my underpants when I'm not around. 
And as long as you sort of put them back in the car, I wouldn't even notice they were folded, to be completely honest. You just put them back. So, uh, so they can spend a long time in the attacker's domain. That's very problematic in terms of... I mean, we're not going to run Windows XP on them or anything, but nevertheless, uh, we do have to be concerned about the realities of this. And there's no upgrades or patches. So this is the nightmare that we're living through at the moment with Internet of Things, which is, you know, people put out kettles or whatever you're going to Wi-Fi up. Somebody hacks into it and you say, oh, well, that's okay because we have a simple patch for that. <laughs> we have a simple patch for that. So people are going to download and patch their kettles and away they go. This is never going to happen, right? You can't get people to take Volkswagens back to get the software on it patched. Like, you've got a Volkswagen. Like, can you drop it? We just need to upgrade the software. People won't even do that because it, it makes the car less powerful, so they don't do it. And it's what's called an externality. Like, if I've got the Volkswagen that has more power, I couldn't care less about the pollution. It's not my problem. It's an externality. So you're not going to get me to patch it. So you really think, when I get an email which says, oh, by the way, uh, we've noticed that you've got version 7.1 of the Marks and Spencer's autograph black boxer shorts. That's actually true, I do. Uh, and, they, and we're afraid we've discovered a security flaw in this particular model. So would you please um, you know, bring your underpants back for upgrading at the earliest opportunity? Like, if I got an email like that, I'd assume it was from Emma, frankly. But that's... Uh... So basically, it's as bad as it can possibly be. And there are people out there, not the people in this room, but there are people that are out there right now putting chips in everything and connecting it up without thinking any of this stuff through. That's my point. So what are we going to do about it? <clears throat> well, um, there are a group of people who are hell-bent on derailing technological progress and returning us to a dark age when we couldn't read each other's underwear. And these Luddites, or lawyers as some people call them, these Luddites are trying to stop us from doing this. And I'm sure all the forces of Silicon Valley entrepreneurialism will make sure that this never happens. So, uh, by the way, I didn't make this up. This is from a real law. That's actually a real paper from a real law journal. These spoil sports, maybe your end to wear, does not need to be connected. To the what are they thinking? Really, they want us to live in the 1950s or something. I no, no sympathy with these people. So, uh, so um, we have to do something. Because sooner or later, the lawyers are going to get wind of the bonanza that's available for this sort of thing. And we don't want it to be us that get caught by that. So what are we going to do? Well, you already know the answer. Blockchain. Were well, you not listening yesterday? <laughs> we, all, we already know what the answer is going to be. So I just want to make the point. So we were continuously making fun yesterday, justifiably in some cases. Uh, I mean, it's not fair to talk about it. I, I, I won't mention what happened. I, I was at a thing a couple of weeks ago. It's just a supply chain thing. And, and so, uh, so we're in the coffee thing, and the guy is talking to one of my clients. He's talking to one of my clients. He said, and he's talking about using the blockchain to improve this supply chain application they're looking at. And I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. That's a really interesting application. I said, um, um, it's a blockchain. What, what's, actually, what's in the blocks? He goes, well, we don't actually have blocks. <clears throat> we're just take, we're taking the transactions atomically and storing them in the, but we're taking the hashes of the transactions and we're storing them in a monotonically increasing write-only timestamp list. Okay, that's good. So there's no, so, but wait a second, how are you chaining them together? Because well, they're not actually chained together, because we're taking the hashes from the database where we've hashed them and we're putting them in a Merkle tree. You can see the order of the hashes and you can. Okay, so there's no blocks and there's no chain. Just to be clear, no, but it's a blockchain. So it's interesting. So in this blockchain, how do people form consensus in this blockchain? And he said, well, it's a master-slave consensus. So the purchaser has the master copy of the blockchain. And the suppliers have slave copies, but their slave copy only contains the data that's relevant to their product line. They can't see other people's. And so it gets updated by the master. And, then the, and I'm like, this sounds very much like DB2. I mean, aren't you getting a little bit confused with what's going on in this blockchain space. No, no. It's the blockchain. <laughs> so I was talking to Sabir. So I said, OK, let's have a think. Like, how could we actually use the blockchain to actually do something about this general problem? 
and, uh, and I was reminded that um, the guy that runs Google, uh, by the way, I said this first. No one paid any attention. I said this age, it's on my blog. I said this ages ago, that there's this odd relationship between blockchain and the Internet of Things. No one paid the slide. Eric says it. Oh, now it's a thing, you know. Now people are making memes out of it. <clears throat> but the point is, there's some odd connection. Because in the, in the mundane world, I don't use the word real ever since the Trump thing, so I, just to distinguish. Uh, so in the mundane world, things in the mundane world have a very obvious property, which is that there's only one of them. There's only one of this, right? And if I give this cup to Susan, now I don't have it, and Susan does. This is one of the characteristics of a blockchain. But it's also one of the characteristics of the real world. So there's this interesting and odd homomorphism between blockchain stuff and real world stuff. So for things that there should only be one of in the real world, the use case that everyone knows of is Bitcoin. That's probably the worst use case. A much better, so was your trigger word Bitcoin? I apologize. <laughs> Unreservedly. I did not see that one coming. Dasher and I, we went through the whole list earlier on. I did not see that one coming. I apologize unreservedly. So, uh, so there's the Bitcoin use case. But actually, there are other things that we'd probably want to do that with that are more valuable. Um, event tickets, Vivian Westwood clothing, that sort of thing. So how can we exploit this interesting characteristic we have a real world with things in that there can only be one of. And we have these new set of data structures, this new set of cryptographic techniques, these new ways of organizing data where there can only be one of. So not like, you know, because this was the whole problem that Bitcoin was designed to fix, which is I have a digital asset. I give you a copy of it. I've still got a copy of it, right? That's okay when it's pictures of celebrities leaked from, from so I shouldn't have said that out loud. I was thinking that, but I shouldn't have said that one. That's OK when it's pictures of pop stars or something. Um, but uh, it's not OK when it's event tickets. So how can we link the things in the real world to this new class of digital assets, which we can only have one of? Maybe there's some way of doing this around the blockchain. So here's my simple model of the world. So I'm going to set about building the Internet of Underpants. Now, I'm not going to go for the whole, solving the whole of the Internet of Things, that's like a big, especially for 9 o'clock in the morning. So, uh, so I won't make as bold a claim as to say, here's an idea for fixing the Internet of Things, but I think I can have a crack at how we can get the Internet of Pants up and running. So here's a model of my pants. Pants I'm using as the generic word for all forms of clothing now. Because... See, that's a funny joke to a blockchain audience because they're using the word blockchain generically to mean all forms of shared ledgers with a Byzantine fault tolerant. Uh, okay, all right. Jokes that you have to explain from now on, no. So, uh, so, uh, so things in the real world. So here's a hierarchy. So here are, some, here are some things in the real world, right? So there are things, and there are things that are sort of belonging to other... Th Is this too technical for you? I just, okay, so there's things, and there are some things that belong to other things, right? So I'm just saying there's things, but there's also like a hierarchy of things. But we need to map all of the things down to the, to the, okay, there's things, all right? That's the, so here's my model of the world is things, and we're going to take those things, and what we're going to do with them is we're going to figure out how to put them on the blockchain. And so this is from a conference uh, I spoke at a few weeks ago, and, and they drew some pictures. I explained how to put things. So it's all taken care of. So I explained how you put people's underpants on the blockchain, and they, they drew a diagram. It's very fashionable at some conferences. Not this one. Uh, it's very fashionable at some conferences. They have an artist who draws a diagram. So basically, there it is. It's all fixed. And the idea, essentially, is if you take the tag in my underpants. So the tag in my underpants has a unique number in it. Um, but under my crackpot scheme, that unique number isn't the number of the pants. That unique number is a smart contract address. So now, when we get into the thorny question of whether my underwear is allowed to talk to Susan's underwear, 
How that actually works in practice is when I read Susan's underwear, what I get is a smart contract address. I query the smart contract address. The smart contract is perfectly capable of deciding whether to let me have access to some of the data or not. I mean, not in the general case. I just, for the rest of the audience, I just want to make that clear. <clears throat> but you see what I mean? So like, there are ways of thinking this through. So we can take the items in the real world that have the chip and the unique number, and we can map that unique number to something, which for sake of argument we're going to call a smart contract, which sits on the distributed ledger, and we can use that to manage the identity policies that we actually want in place. So at first, it sounds complicated because of all those reasons I gave you. But actually, if the tag on my underpants, if, if what it gave away was something that could be queried, now we're getting somewhere. Okay? Because you wouldn't know wh who that belonged to or what, until you'd been through the query process. And also smart contracts and have local data, which is maintainable. So that's a very interesting way of thinking about these things. But in, in a few projects we've been involved with recently, the thinking has been evolving in a slightly different direction, which I want to share with you now. I'm a bit annoyed about Jerry for giving some of it away yesterday because, because the Canadian project is one of the projects that we work on. But I want to show it to you in the Internet of Things example. <clears throat> so um, in my Twitter alter ego of uh, the world's number one blockchain curmudgeon. Whenever I've got nothing to do during the day, I look through my Twitter feed and someone at some point will post, oh, here's an interesting example about how the blockchain is going to, you know, whatever, solve global poverty or end world hunger or something like that. And uh, I mean, I'm not against those things. That's not the point I'm making. I mean, I, I think we should, broadly speaking, end global poverty. And I mean, most people would be on the same page on this, I imagine. So, uh, uh, so I'm, not, I'm not being negative about that. But, but, so, but they're very unspecific about how the blockchain is going to end world hunger. So the question that I always pose is when somebody says, well, we're going to use the blockchain to do X, is I post what, you know, okay, what's in the blocks? That became my sort of catchphrase. In fact, one of my friends, there's a Dave Birch bot, there's a DDW Birch bot that auto posts what's in the blocks to things that mention the blockchain. And I think people genuinely do think it's me. Like, I have literally nothing else to do all day than sit down, post. I mean, I post on a variety of things, not just what's in the blocks. So, uh, so and here are a few basic answers to that question. So what's in the blocks? Well, you know, you can put data in the blocks, right? So like bitcoin -y sort of thing. And then you can form a global consensus over all of that data. So that's one way of doing it. But because we're interested in privacy, uh, that's not a very good idea because we don't want everybody to read everything that's, that's on the blockchain everywhere, right? So, um, so what some people are talking about saying, well, why don't we encrypt some of the data and put that on the blockchain? And for people in this audience, that's quite a good answer because there are people in this audience who understand about trust groups and key management and encryption and stuff like that. So we can encrypt some stuff and put it on the blockchain and then it's only readable to people that are within our trust group. And okay, then we have the problem of managing the trust group, but there are people who know how to manage. That's a solved problem, right, Don? You know how to take care of trust groups, right? So, um, or you can not put data on the blockchain at all. Actually, in 90% of the press articles you read, oh, they're going to put the Ruritanian land registry on the blockchain, right, is actually this third case. What they're actually doing is taking hashes of Ruritanian land registry documents and putting the hashes on the blockchain so you can tell whether they've been tampered with. You, well, you can tell whether they've been tampered with under certain circumstances. I mean, if it's one of those kind of editable blockchains that Essence is going on about, then you wouldn't know whether it had been changed anyway. So. But what's emerging as the interesting way of solving some of these problems, which Jerry spoiled yesterday by talking about it, is actually, instead of putting data on the blockchain, what we do is form zero-knowledge proofs of data, and we store the proofs on the blockchain. So broadly speaking, I go to log into an adult website, and the adult website has a security policy which exists on the blockchain. And the security policy says, uh, essentially, you have to be in the set of all the people who are over 18. And then I construct a cryptographic proof that I'm a member of that set, which then I can hand to the website. The website now knows I'm a member of the set 
of people who are overrated, but it doesn't know which one. It can't possibly tell which one. And when I'm forming the proof, the proof doesn't depend on the identity of the person I'm forming it. I'm forming it for. So when you put the proof onto the blockchain, the proof, the proof contains no personally identifiable information about me, nor does it contain anything about the reason why it was constructed. So, uh, so Jerry was touching on a really serious line of thinking about this yesterday. So the idea I'm going to plant is that uh, if we actually want to do something about the Internet of Things, which is in, by the way, a very catastrophic state at the moment, um, and we were laughing about the blockchain being the solution to absolutely everything, but in this one instance, it may well be that some form of shared ledger system with some form of smart contract management, with some form of zero-knowledge proof, might be the way forward. So then when I want to prove auditably, right? let's say there's some query about whether I should have been allowed onto that website or not, the record is on the blockchain. It doesn't give anything away. I mean, I know it's me, but you wouldn't know it's me unless I pointed to it. So now I can prove that I proved to the website that I was over 18, if you see what I mean. So, uh, so I think... Uh, there's a little way forward opening up in the IoT space coming from a slightly different direction that might well be worth exploring. Okay, so, um, and we can take that a little bit further. Here's a paper that was published a couple of weeks ago which caught my eye, which is why I wanted to share it with you. So, one of the, see, one of the other things you can do, so with these, with these anonymous credentials, the, 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 because you can maintain a history of them, which you can use to build a reputation, under certain cryptographic conditions, then those reputations become, in this example, blacklistable. In other words, they, they become valuable. So now you have the solution to the, to the TripAdvisor problem. So now you can prove that you went to the hotel without giving away any information about yourself and blah, blah, blah. And if you give bogus reviews, people can discount your reviews and not use them. And so then you have reputation systems that are ungameable. And if you start applying those to IoT, I mean, we can think of the simple examples like TripAdvisor, but now you can start exploiting those in the IoT space. Because now the question about which cars can open my garage door now become a problem we, we can express in a new and interesting way, which actually simultaneously, and I don't want to bring Snowden back into it, but I agree with what he said yesterday. We shouldn't be talking about a privacy and security balance or trade-off. We should be setting the bar way higher than that. We want privacy and security. And this could be a way of doing it. And if you look at the diagram from that paper, about the, if you turn that diagram on its side, then you'll see the Internet of Things solution that I gave earlier on, which is this. So now we have a way of building this ledger of storing things on it in a privacy-enhancing way, of making the discussions between things, the discussions between smart contracts rather than the smart objects themselves, because we don't have the cryptographic power to put inside the objects. So I'm not saying it's necessarily um, uh, the absolute be-all and end-all, but I, I think if you're looking for an interesting new area to work on, I think, I think this might be it. Now, I just want to caution you that you see, you think that by, I was using underpants as an example because I want to, you to think about this stuff, right? And if I'd have been talking about bloody thermostats and light bulbs, you'd have been asleep by now. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, who wants to hear one more presentation about, about, uh, about light bulbs being... Although, actually, there was a funny story about it. So I was thinking the other day, this guy said he installed one of those light things where you can control it from your iPad. It does all the... And he spent... Eight, he was inviting a girl over. This is a true story. And he spent ages fiddling about with the lights to get them into the optimally romantic configuration, like exactly the right soft lighting in this place, brighter lighting. He spent ages working on this to get the exact thing, right? So um, he invites the girl back to his apartment. They walk in. He turns on the light. And a thing comes up which says it's downloading version 5. of the, And it took nine minutes just standing there with his date, waiting for nine minutes in the dark while the software downloaded uh, to reboot. But I don't want to tell you stories about light bulbs. I'm telling you about underpants because I want you to remember the presentation. But I want you to be very clear that underpants are not the least, uh, are absolutely the least of your problems. Underpa by comparison to what's actually going on, underpants are absolutely nothing. And I want to show you two examples. So one is Fitbits for dogs. OK, you thought that was as far as we were going. These are Fitbits for penises. And uh, 
this is the sort of thing that's being sold, right? These are Bluetooth, by the way. So can you just tell her that, that it was on Alibaba, not eBay? I can, yeah. So, uh, so <laughs> I apologize. I couldn't resist the joke. I'm sorry. So, um, so, uh, <clears throat> so uh, and I saw a presentation about the security. So basically, a lot of these go out the factory with the same Bluetooth passcode, which is 0000, and people never set it. So if you wander around a hotel late at night with the Bluetooth scanner and you want some mischief. <laughs> really, because you've seen all the movies. You know, you want something else to do, don't you? So, so but the point is, this is what people are, like, this is, people are actually going out selling this stuff right now. With no, and, and so, like, oh, it's funny if my lights fail, you know, that's, but now this is getting a little bit more serious, right? So if the, if the data from your penis Fitbit gets leaked, I mean, some of us wouldn't bother about it, but, you know, other people might. But it isn't just the devices themselves. So you remember those spoil sport lawyers I was telling you about earlier on? <clears throat> so this is actually for a Bluetooth vibrator, not for a Bluetooth uh, Fitbit thing. So these were vibrators, the internet-connected vibrators. These were hackable, and they did indeed get hacked. So the devices are a problem. But a much bigger problem, as you'll see from the lawsuit that was filed, by the way, I haven't updated this, but they actually lost the lawsuit, so the, the lawyers won. So the class action lawsuit succeeded. I think they got $5 million. I can't remember exactly. They lost. So on this one, even if the devices were secure, the telemetry data from the vibrators was being uploaded to a server on the internet. So if you knew the Bluetooth address, you could log into the server and you could get the telemetry data. You know, when, where, how long for, body temperature. Stop looking at Do I have to spell it out for you, Don? It's a bad thing. Like that telemetry data, it's like he's thinking, hmm, analysis. You could put that in an Excel spreadsheet and you could look at trends. No, it's a bad thing. Those things don't belong in Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> Even between mummies and daddies that really love each other. That's why so, uh, so I just, so I want to make the point, like, it's funny looking at this stuff, but it's a really serious issue. It's not just the devices, it's the data from the devices that needs to be secured as well. So I want to make a suggestion for the uh, One World Identity. I was extremely flattered to be in invited here today, and I was more than flattered to be asked a keynote, which I thank you very much for. So I, I want to make a very positive suggestion in return, which is... We spent all of yesterday talking about how we're not fixing the problem of identity for people. Um, I think uh, a potentially valuable role for One World Identity in this space will be to start the conversation about identity for things, because this is a market failure issue, right? So when I was a little boy, I was told that the internet had been built to withstand nuclear war. And what I actually read in the newspaper is some toasters brought down PayPal. This is a bit of a mismatch, if you ask me. So I go, it's like, now, the, uh, it's going to make the war movies boring, isn't it? It's going to be no more saving Private Ryan, people storming beaches and whatever. It's just people eating tuna out of a can, sitting in a darkened room with a... <clears throat> and I'll mourn that. I really will. But my point is, this is evidence of market failure. If my toaster takes down PayPal, I don't care. It's not my problem. It doesn't cost me anything. It doesn't lose me anything. I don't care. The people making the toaster clearly don't care. Otherwise, they'd have put some security in it in the first place. And the fact that we can coordinate these on a mass scale because of the internet means that the internet of things is so dangerous by comparison. You know, it's funny when it's your credit card that gets stolen. I don't care. It's the bank's problem. That's why I use credit cards. But when it's people crashing your car and stuff like that, it's a little bit more worrisome. So I just I want to finish by saying, I think, given some of the things I heard yesterday, some of the things I've heard recently, there is a new class of technologies coming into play which could genuinely offer something into that Internet of Things space. It sounds odd that we would be thinking about things like blockchain for Internet of Things, but there's a very interesting connection. Two, there are new cryptographic techniques coming into play homomorphic encryption and things like this and zero knowledge proofs, which give us an incredible power that we didn't have before to deliver the security and the privacy around things. And thirdly, because it's a market failure, it needs industry coordination 
to take it forward. Someone has got to start thinking about how to organize monitor, number, manage. If this is going to be a solution, it has to be a coordinated solution. And I think that's a very positive role that One World Identity could play. So thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it.